بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبي إله العالمين أبو القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah we will begin the tafsir the exegesis of Ayatul Kursi Ayatul Kursi is regarded as the greatest verse in the Quran according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Ayatul Kursi has many blessings and benefits and a great reward in reciting this very important verse Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi instructed the Muslims to recite it in times of difficulties in times of stress and distress as the times that we are in right now. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa instructed the Muslims to recite Ayatul Kursi in times of danger, as the times that we are in right now. So, inshallah, we will begin with the analysis of Ayatul Kursi, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the tawfiq to be able to explain and understand and interpret this important verse in the Quran. Now, before we begin in analyzing this very important verse, what is Ayatul Kursi? A lot of people, they say, I hear about Ayatul Kursi, Ayatul Kursi, but what is Ayatul Kursi? Ayah is a verse in the Quran, and Kursi means the chair. So this is the verse of the chair, and the reason why it is referred to as the verse of the chair, because the name of the chair or the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The chair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the throne which symbolizes the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encompassed the universe and the earth. So this is why it's referred to as the verse of the chair. And this is a name that was given to it by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And Rasulullah does not do anything independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that Rasulullah does is a divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibra'il. So this is the title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it. Now, what is Ayatul Kursi? Ayatul Kursi is Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 255. This is the popular opinion of what Ayatul Kursi is, because Ayah is one verse, and Ayatul Kursi is the verse of the chair. However, some scholars, they have added verses 256 and 257 with it. So instead of ending at وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Some scholars say it is out of obligatory precaution, احتياط وجوبي, to end with هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ So if you want the ultimate reward, the ultimate thawab of reciting this great verse, then you would have to recite until هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Of course, different scholars have different views. Ayatullah al khoi one of the grand maraja of the Shia, he, his opinion was that Ayatul Kursi is only verse 255. And Ay Ayatullah Sistani, a living grand marja right now, he says that it is out of obligatory precaution to add verse 256 and 257 if you want to receive the full reward. Of course, Regardless of that, Sayyid al khoi and Sayyid Sistani, they say that there are certain prayers, there are certain a'mal that you would have to recite verse 255 until 257. One of those cases is when you recite Salat al-Wahsha. Salat al-Wahsha is the prayer that is done on the night of someone being buried. When someone is being buried, after that person has been buried, that night, that evening, between Maghrib and Asha prayer, it is recommended to pray a prayer which is called the prayer of the lonely. Basically, the person who has passed away that night in the grave is a very lonely night for them. And 
the hadith states that if you want this person to to um, to remove the wahsha, the loneliness that this person is experiencing, then you recite this prayer. You do this prayer. It's a two rak'ah prayer. In one rak'ah, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha and Ayatul Kursi. And in the second rak'ah, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha and ten times, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. The whole surah, Surah Al-Qadr. So here, even Ayatollah Khoi, who says that Ayatul Kursi is, is only one verse, he says in this salah, in this prayer, Salat al Wahsha, he says, Ihtiyat, you do the three verses. Surat Ayatul Kursi, verse two, uh, 255 of Surat al Baqarah, and 256 and 257. So I'm going to recite Ayatul Kursi, and then inshallah we will go on to look at the benefits of this very important verse. As you will see on the screen, the verses Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wala noom. Lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil arv. Man the levi yashfa'u endahu illa bi idnih. Ya'lamu ma bayna aidihim wa ma khalfahum. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ This is the first verse. Then 256, Allah says in the Quran, لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينِ قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّشْدُ مِنَ الْغَيْمِ فَمَنْ يَقْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ لَنْفِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ This is the second, 256. And then 257, Allah states, اللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاءُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ أُولَائِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ now, the reason why some people say it's you add 256 and 257, what the opinion is that because it's recited together, sometimes we have some hadith that says you recite all of them, you recite until 257, until hum fiha khalidun. So some would assume they thought that it is all one verse. But the Qur'ans that we have right now, they all stop at wahwa al azim That is Ayatul Kursi. However, if you want extra thawab, if you want extra reward, then you should go until hum fiha khalidun to receive the ultimate reward of reciting this very important verse in the Quran. Now, as we know, we have a hadith, we have several narrations from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that ayatul kursi is a'zamu ayah fil Quran. It is the greatest verse in the Holy Quran. Out of the whole Quran, 114 chapters with thousands of verses, this verse, Ayatul Kursi, is the greatest of all of the verses. And there are several narrations from Rasulullah, from the Imams. And by the way, Ayatul Kursi, the greatness of Ayatul Kursi is something that is accepted by Sunnis and Shias alike. So it's not something that only the Shias regard. No, it's something that you will find in the Sunni text and in the Shia text, the importance and the greatness of this very important verse. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Ubay ibn Ka'b, one of the companions of the Prophet, he asked him, Ayyu ayah min ayat kitab Allah afdal? What is the greatest verse of all of the verses in the Quran? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. Referring to Ayatul Kursi, the verse that starts with Allah, La ilaha illahu, there is no God other than He, the ever living. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyu al qayyum. In another hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says that Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, the great companion of Rasulullah, the great companion of Amir al Mu'mineen, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He tells him, Ma afdalu ayah, ma afdalu ma an unzila alayk. What is the greatest that was revealed upon you, O Rasulullah? So Rasulullah tells him, Ayatul Kursi. 
Ayatul Kursi, the verse of the chair, because the chair is mentioned in it. So therefore, it is known as Ayatul Kursi. In another hadith from Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, an Rasulullah, he narrates from Rasulullah, he says, Qala Sayyidul Quran al Baqarah. The Quran it has a Sayyid, the master of the Quran, is Surah al Baqarah. Wa Sayyidul Baqarah, Ayatul Kursi. And the Sayyid, the master of Al Baqarah is Ayatul Kursi. And then he says, Ya Ali, inna fiha la khamsina kalima. Within it are 50 words. Fi kulli kalima khamsuna baraka. In every word, there are 50 blessings. Of course, this in this verse, for example, the, uh, the, the Prophet says, Sayyidul Quran al Baqarah. The master of the Quran is Al Baqarah. We have an, another hadith, for example, Qalb al Quran, the heart of the Quran is Yasin. So there are different descriptions for different chapters in the Quran. However, several narrations that we have from the Sunni and the Shia say that the, say that the, um, the greatest verse in the Quran is, in fact, Ayatul Kursi. In another hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Imam al-Baqir, he says, قَالَ مَنْ قَرَأَ آيَةُ الْكُرْسِ مَرَّ صَرَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَلْفْ مَكْرُوهُ مِنْ مَكَارِهِ الدُّنْيَا If someone recites Ayat al-Kursi once, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect this person from 1,000 evils and harms, the harms of this life. وَأَلْفْ مَكْرُوهُ مِنْ مَكَارِهِ الْآخِرَةِ and 1,000 evils and harms from the harms of the afterlife, the akhirah. Aysar makruh al-dunya al-faqr wa aysar makruh al-akhirah adab al-qabr. He says the easiest, the least thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove in this life, this e the, one of the thousand evils that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove in this life, the least of them is poverty. That's the least thing. So there's many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from. The least thing is poverty. And the easiest, the least thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove from the thousand uh, evils of the akhirah is the torment of the grave. So just through this, if you want to not have poverty, you recite Ayat al Kursi. If you don't want to experience Adab al Qabr, you recite Ayat al Kursi. And this is just by reciting it once. Now, of course, we have narrations that says that you recite it more than once, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you more. In a hadith, if you recite Ayatul Kursi one time, this is a hadith from Rasulullah, you recite Ayatul Kursi one time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send one angel to protect you. You recite it two times, Allah will send two angels to protect you. You recite it three times, Allah will send three angels to protect you. You don't need bodyguards. You have the angels that are protecting you. And if you recite it four times, Allah will tell the angels, leave this person. Leave them. Leave them. I will protect this person. Allah says, Allah will be the protector. So this is why it's very recommended to recite Ayatul Kursi. And it's recommended to recite it in times of distress, in times of difficulty. Before you sleep, before your eyes fall asleep, you recite Ayatul Kursi. After each prayer, as soon as you finish, finish each prayer, you recite Ayatul Kursi. A lot of us today, we have a habit. As soon as we finish our prayer, we stretch our hands out and we want to shake hands with people. Now, regardless of the fact that we're dealing with Corona or not, this is not a mustahab thing to do. The mustahabat are the taqibat of the salah. You do Tasbihat al-Zahra, you recite Ayat al-Kursi, you recite the du'as. We don't have anywhere that it says you have to stretch your hand and shake hands with everyone that's sitting around you in the, as soon as you finish the prayer. Yes, we say taqabbal Allah after the prayer, after we get up from our seat, after we get up from the sajada. Some of us, we have a habit, as soon as we finish, the first thing, before saying anything, we stretch our hands and we want to we wanna shake hands with people. So... We have to see what's important. One of the hadith, the hadith says that after you finish each prayer, recite Ayat al-Kursi. Recite the Taqibat. 
recite tasbihat al-zahra. These are the things that we have to focus on doing. Another time that it's recommended to recite Ayat al-Kursi is when you're leaving the house. When you're stepping out of the house, recite it because that's a protection. When you want to remove the evil eye, when there's an evil eye on you, you're afraid of the evil eye, you recite Ayat al-Kursi. When you're seeking safety in general, you recite Ayat al-Kursi. During the time of Rasulullah, Rasulullah would tell the Muslims, when you're riding on your mule, when you're riding on a camel, when you're riding on a horse, recite Ayat al-Kursi. Today we tell people when you're getting in the car, as soon as you turn on the car, before you turn on the radio, before you listen to anything, before you start conversations, recite Ayat al-Kursi. Because it is a form of protection for you and a form of protection for your family. In a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, if a person every day recites Ayatul Kursi 11 times and Surah al Tawheed 11 times and Surah Al Qadr, Inna Anzalna 11 times. So, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad and Inna Anzalna Fi Laylat Al Qadr and Ayatul Kursi, each one reciting it 11 times, Allah will protect you and Allah will protect your family. We should make it a habit, my dear brothers and sisters. Make it a habit to any time you get in the car, any time you're getting in an airplane, any time you're leaving the house, before you sleep, after prayer, to recite Ayatul Kursi because it is a very important verse in the Quran that has a lot of reward and a lot of blessings and protection. So there are benefits in reciting Ayatul Kursi. In a hadith uh, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Man qara'a Ayatul Kursi dubara kulli salatin maktuba. The one who recites Ayat al-Kursi after every obligatory salah, salat al-maktubah, kana alladhi yatawalla qabdu nafsihi dhul jalali wal ikram. The one who will take your soul will not be the angel of death. The one who will take your soul will be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Arham al-Rahim, the most merciful. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu yatawaffa al-anfus hina mawtiha. In one verse, Allah says, God is the one who takes the soul. In another verse, Allah says, the angels, تتوفاهم رسولنا. In another verse, قُلْ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ الَّذِي وُكِّلَ بِكُمْ The angel of death takes your soul. The greater you are in Iman, Allah will take money away. The angel of death, you're, you, don't, you don't bother with this person. I am the compassionate. I am the merciful. I will be the one who will take the soul of this person. So the Prophet says, uh, um, من قرأ آية الكرسي دبر كل صلاة مكتوبة كان الذي يتولى قبض نفسه ذو الجلال والإكرام. Of course, don't think that when the angel of death is taking the soul, that is also Allah subhanahu wa taala taking the soul. But in the act of taking the soul and extracting the soul will be done by Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then the hadith continues. It says وكان كمن قاتل مع أنبياء الله حتى استشهد. This person will be, will receive the reward of the ones who fought with the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until they were martyred. Imagine you're in the jihad and you are with the prophets of Allah. You are with Rasulullah, you are with Musa, with Isa, with Ibrahim, with, with the prophets of Allah. You're on the side of the prophets and you were killed on the side of the prophets. How, if you want that position, all you have to do is recite Ayatul Kursi. Recite it once after every salah. And we should, this is a reminder for myself and for every single one of us. In another hadith, an Ali alayhi salam from Amir al Mu'mineen, qala sami'tu nabiyukum ala a'wad al minbar wa huwa yaqul. He tells the people, I heard your Prophet, Rasulullah, on the minbar. He's on the, on the minbar, on the pulpit. And he's saying, "Man qara'a ayat al-kursi fi dubr kulli salat al-maktuba, lam yamnahu min dhuul al-jannah illa al-maut, wa la yuwadib alayha illa sadiq aw abid." He says, "I heard Rasulullah saying, the one who recites ayat al-kursi after every wajib prayer, the only thing that will be in your way from entering paradise is death." Meaning the only door that you have to go through to enter paradise is death. That's it. You, you go straight to paradise. There's nothing, no other obstacle in the way. And then he says, وَلَا يُوَاضِبْ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا صَدِّيقَ أَوْ عَابِدٍ And the only one who actually 
make sure that they recite Ayatul Kursi after every obligatory prayer as a Siddiq, the truthful ones, or a Abid, a true worshiper. So if I want to be a Siddiq, if I want to be a Abid, I have to make it a habit of reciting Ayatul Kursi. My dear brothers and sisters, a lot of us, we say, I've been praying, I've been praying my whole life, but I don't see the benefit of my prayer. One of the key reasons is that we disregard the ta'qibat of the salah. The ta'qibat is what is in between the prayers. The tasbihat al-zahra, the sitting before the prayer, the after the prayer, the du'as, doing the mustahabat. We, we pray and then we get up and we do the next prayer as if we have a, a race to finish. When we do that, that shows that we're not going the extra mile. But when you actually make an effort to sit for 10 minutes, to sit for five minutes between each prayer and doing the tasbihat al-zahra, doing ayat al-kursi, reciting the dua, the dua of that specific prayer, that, sh that will give you the, it will make you have that khushu'ah. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Allah says the believers are the successful ones. The ones who in their prayer, they pray with humility. If I want to have humility, it's not just the prayer that I have to focus on. It's the before and the after prayer. Many of us, many of the, you know, in the previous classes, they would ask, how do I have spirituality? I try to focus on prayer. Yes, try to focus on prayer, but sometimes it's what's before and after the prayer that we have to also be careful of. So in a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, talking about the greatness of Ayatul Kursi, he says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealing the Qur'an, four verses or four of the Qur'an, four pieces of the Qur'an attached themselves to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that they are, they are very close to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they attach themselves to the throne and they tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ilahi, O oh our Lord, we are in this place of purity and you're bringing us down to the humans who are full of sin and vices, meaning that to the Ayatul Kursi and Al-Fatiha and Ayat, Shah, Ayat al-Shahada, Shahidallahu an, Annahu La Ilaha Illahu, Chapter 3, uh, Al-Imran, Verse 18 and 19, and the next one, and the fourth one is Qulillahumma Malik al Mulk, Ayat al Mulk, which is Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 26 to 27. Qulillahumma Malik al Mulk. These are the four verses, Al Fatiha, Ayat al Kursi, and these two, ch uh, chapter 3, verse 18 to 19, and um, chapter 3, 26 to 27. These verses, they held on to the Arsh because they were very close. So they tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, you're bringing us down to these sinners. So then Allah tells them, Whoever recites you, I will look at this person with my watchful eye. I will be watching over this person and I will bless this person's life. So these are the four. Al-Fatiha, reciting Al-Fatiha, which we explained in the previous class in the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha, the greatness of it. Al-Fatiha held on to the Arsh. And Ayatul Kursi, and Ayat al-Shahada. Shahidallahu annahu la ilaha illa hu wal malaikatu. That verse and Qulillahumma malik al-mulk tu'ti al-mulk. So these are the verses that held on to the throne. So we have to make an effort to recite these verses. And if we do so, we will see many benefits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the one who's protecting us. Allah will be the one who's watching over us. So make it an effort to recite it once a day. When you're getting in the car, when you're driving, before you do anything, before you start your day, recite Ayat al-Kursi, recite Al-Fatiha. Of course, if you could recite Ayat al-Kursi 11 times, Qulhu Allahu Ahad 11 times, Inna Anzalna 11 times, and these verses, the verse of Ayat al-Shahada and Ayat al mul Now, the verse continues. We're going to go into the analysis of Ayat al-Kursi. Allah says in the Quran, in the verse, Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. This is what we're, we're going to look at today. So the verse begins with Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. Now, Allah, there is no deity except Him. Allah la ilaha, there's no deity 
illa except him who is also one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the inapparent name Allah is the apparent name and who is the inapparent the hidden name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so scholars have pointed out that this verse is very unique because the name of Allah is mentioned several times in this verse and it starts with Allah and it ends with al Ali al Azim, and even in the first sentence, in the first phrase of the verse, Allah, the name of Allah is mentioned several times. Allah, la ilaha illa who, who is also Him, referring to Allah subhanahu wa taala. So the first part of the verse begins with the name of Allah, and the end also with the name of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now, what is what does Allah mean? Allah is the name of God that defines all of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Hayy, Al-Qayyum, Al-Jabbar, all of these 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want one word to sum up the definition of all of these words of Allah, all of these words of God, the merciful, the compassionate, the all-seeing, the all-hearing, all of these names, if you want one word that defines all of those, that is Allah. Allah is the defining word of all of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is Allah. Now, la ilaha illahu. There is no deity except Him. Of course, this is the most important message of all of the prophets. Every single prophet, they came with the message of tawheed. Tawheed means that you worship only Allah. You don't look at anything or anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah la ilaha illa hu. Now, la ilaha illa Allah, this is also the meaning of Allah. La ilaha illa Allah, there is no God except Him. What does that equal to? What, there is no one other than Him. That is equal to Allah. So this verse is full of the name of Allah. Allah is one. La ilaha illahu is also what the definition of Allah because God by definition, Allah by definition is the one that there is no power, no might other than Him. So la ilaha illahu, there's no deity except Him is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means. So that's a def definition of what Allah means and it's a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no deity other than who who is the inapparent? It's the batin. The, the words of the Quran, they have zahir and they have batin. Sometimes Allah speaks with me, to me with zahir, with what's apparent. And sometimes Allah speaks to me with what is batin. Allah is the apparent name of Allah. Who is the batin? The inapparent name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah la ilaha illa hu. So, la ilaha illa hu is actually la ilaha illa Allah. Because who is Allah? So, la ilaha illa Allah. And this is kalimatu tawheed. Kalimatu tawheed. This is the sentence of tawheed. La ilaha illa Allah. This is what you have to say to be a Muslim. To believe, you testify that there is no God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, according to narrations, the greatest form of dhikr. The greatest dhikr, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you could say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. The greatest is la ilaha illallah. And it is also the easiest. See, everyone, wherever you're sitting, say la ilaha illallah. You don't move your lips. All you do is you move your tongue. La ilaha illallah. You say anything else, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, it takes effort. This one, doesn't take effort. All you do is you move your tongue. La ilaha illallah. And this is why, this is what is expected of me to say as my last word before I leave this life. When it becomes difficult to speak, this is what we have to say. This is what we should say. Of course, many people, they find it very difficult to say this. It's very difficult. The hadith says, La ilaha illallah. Khafifatun ala lisan. It is very light on the tongue. La ilaha illallah. Thaqilatun ala mizan. However, it's very heavy on the mizan. This is why Rasulullah says, whoever 
his last word or her last word is La ilaha illallah, they enter paradise. This is why we have to make it a habit to say La ilaha illallah all times. All the time say La ilaha illallah. Before you sleep, before your, your last word, whatever, you, the, make it be the last word that you say. You're talking, you're, whatever you're doing, before you close your eyes, say La ilaha illallah. Because who knows, death is, uh, sleep is similar to death. Some people, they sleep and they don't wake up. Make it a habit to say La ilaha illallah. In times of danger, if you're going to be in a car accident, whatever it is, say La ilaha illallah. Some of us, you know, we say, oh my God, we get, we, when we get excited. Saying, oh my God, is not bad. You're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we should say La ilaha illallah. Make it be that we are saying La ilaha illallah at all times. So it's the greatest form of dhikr and it's the easiest form of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, dhikran kathira. Remember Allah all the time. The greatest form of dhikr of Allah is to say, La ilaha illallah. One day, some of the poor inhabitants of Medina, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And they told Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, we don't have money to give charity. We don't have money to come and support the Muslims in times of war. We can't donate our swords and horses and mules. We can't do much to support the Muslims. We want to help out the Muslims. We want the thawab that the rich people are receiving. The rich people, they have many more opportunities to receive the thawab. So what should we do? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells them, if you want the thawab, if you want the reward of giving charity in the way of Allah, of helping out, just as much as those who have money help out with their money, with their finances, all you have to do is say La ilaha illallah 100 times a day. You have to say La ilaha illallah 100 times a day. So they said, that's it, O Rasulullah. They said, they, they started doing it. They started saying La ilaha illallah, they became happy. Then the rich people from the Sahaba, they also saw that you know what? It's not hard to say La ilaha illallah. They started saying La ilaha illallah as well. So the poor Sahaba, they came to Rasulullah and they tell Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, but they're also, the, the rich ones are also saying La ilaha illallah. Rasulullah tells them, what can I do? They, they're smart. They're saying La ilaha illallah and they're donating. So then Rasulullah tells them, but you, if you want more tawab, say La ilaha illallah more. So it doesn't have to be a hundred times. Let it be a hundred and fifty. Let it be two hundred. Let it be a thousand times. Whatever it is, the more you say it, the more reward you will receive. So this is regarding la ilaha illallah. Now, when you add ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, when you say I testify, I bear witness that there is no god other than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The hadith says that the angels cannot comprehend the reward. The angels were writing down the reward of the person who says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. They can't even comprehend the reward of the person who says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he tells him, if someone says, if, if you were to take all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the universe and the sun and the solar system and the skies and the earth and the mountains and everything, you put it in one palm, in one hand, and you take ashhadu an la ilaha illallah in another hand, that one will be heavier. The ashhadu an la ilaha illallah will be heavier than everything else. So the value of ashhadu an la ilaha illallah is greater than everything that is created. This is why when you say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, that is your passport to paradise. That is your way of seeking paradise and going to paradise. When you say ashhadu, you're testifying. You say, I bear witness. This is heavier than just saying la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah, you're saying there's no God, there's no deity other than Allah. But when you say, I bear witness, this is a testament of faith, meaning that I bear witness. I'm willing to put my life on this. This is something that I stand for, I believe in, I witness in this. It is said in a beautiful hadith that one day Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, after he became the king, after he was a prisoner, he became a slave and a prisoner, then he became the king, the Aziz of Nasr. He was sitting on his throne in his palace and he was watching people pass by. 
So he sees, as he's sitting, he asks them to put his throne in a, in a place where he, ha he sees people that are passing by. He sees people that he's the king of, he's ruling them. So he sees a very poor young man, a poor young man who's wearing dirty clothes. This person looks miserable. And he was thinking to himself, how is this person miserable? Why is this person in such a state? So Jibra'il comes to Prophet Yusuf. Pr prophet Yusuf is a prophet and Jibra'il is an angel. He comes to him and he tells him, he tells him, oh Yusuf, you see that young man over there who looks miserable? Your honor and your life and your freedom is because of that young man. He looks miserable right now. But this man, it's because of him that you have honor right now. It's because of him that you have freedom right now. So Prophet Yusuf was surprised. Prophet Yusuf is a king now. He's a prophet. He tells him how this man looks miserable. He tells him, remember when you were in the palace of Zuleikha and Zuleikha, the wife of the Pharaoh, the wife of the Aziz at that time, she started running after you. She tried to seduce you. And you had nothing to do with it. But when the authorities, they opened the door and they saw that she was there with you and she right away blamed you, there was a witness. Allah says in the Quran, فَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا There was a witness that testified at that moment. What did the witness testify? The witness, all that the witness said, the witness was a baby that was in the cradle. The, the baby said, if the shirt of Yusuf is ripped from the front, then that means he is the one who's assaulting her. He's the one who's going after her. But if his shirt is ripped from the back, then that means she's running after him and he's trying to escape. And that's what was what happened. What happened? He was running away and she was coming after him. So that witness, that baby, Allah through a miracle began to speak. That baby saved the life of Yusuf. That it was because of that baby that they realized that Yusuf had nothing to do with it. And it was her, Zuleikha, who was running and chasing after Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. So Yusuf said, so this was the child that saved my honor. This was the child that saved my life. Bring him to me. They bring him and Yusuf said, go bring him clothes, give him money, give him wealth, give him food, give him gold, jewelry, whatever it is. Why? Because this young man testified for me. Because he was a witness for me that I did not do anything wrong. While Yusuf السلام, was giving this young man, Jibra'il was standing and smiling. So Yusuf tells him, why are you smiling? He says, I'm smiling because this young man testified for you that you were innocent and look what you're giving him. Imagine the one who testifies that there is no God other than Allah. What will Allah give this person? When someone testifies, when someone says, Ashhadu, I bear witness to be on the witness stand. I witness, I testify that there is no God other than Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a reward that even the angels cannot comprehend. Now, what does La ilaha illallah mean? There is no deity except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean, la ilaha illallah? In order to be a faithful person, in order to believe in God, I have to reject all other deities first. I have to cleanse my heart. The heart, only one love goes in the heart. If I have others in my heart, then I can't say I have others in Allah. This is what the idol worshippers were. The idol worshippers, they didn't reject Allah. They weren't atheists. The idol worshippers, the mushrikeen, they said, we believe in God, but we also believe in these hundreds and thousands of idols as well. They don't reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam came and it says, la ilah, there's no God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the testament of faith. Can you love God and love the enemies of God at the same time? No. Can you love the Ahl al-Bayt, can you love Imam al-Hussein and love the enemies of Imam al-Hussein at the same time? Does it make sense? Can I love Imam al-Hussein and also say there's nothing wrong with the, 
the person, the people who killed Imam Hussein? Can I love Amir al Mu'mineen and also love the enemies of Amir al Mu'mineen? Can I love Fatima al Zahra and also love the enemies of Fatima al Zahra? It doesn't make sense. Similarly, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can't be a worshiper of God while I'm worshiping others. How am I worshiping others? Sometimes it's literal worship of other gods, other deities, and sometimes it's figure, figurative. I have to reject all of the literal idols and the figurative idols that are in my heart. There were people, there were mushrikeen that would worship idols. They see an idol and they go and they pray in front of the idol. This is a deity that they were worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of Allah, they were doing sujood, they were prostrating to an idol. However, Allah says in the Quran, it's not only idols that are worshipped. Sometimes people worship other than idols. Allah says in the Quran, Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani adama Allah ta'budu shaytan. Innahu lakum aduwan mubeen. And have I not told you, O oh, children of Adam, that you shall not worship Satan, that you shall not worship shaytan. Shaitan, Satan is your enemy. Do you find people that actually worship Shaitan today? Yes, they say there is a sect, the Yazidis or something, they worship Shaitan. However, this is, I don't believe this is what the verse is talking about. This is talking about your Shaitan, meaning the desires that Shaitan, Shaitan Allah, has placed in your heart and brought you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَلَمْ أَحَدْ إِلَيْكُمْ يَا بَنِي آدَمَ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُوا Meaning don't obey shaitan. Don't obey the orders of shaitan. Because the hadith says, مَنْ أَصْغَى إِلَى نَاطِقٍ فَقَدْ عَبَدَهِ Whoever is listening to a speaker, it's as if you are worshipping that speaker. Why? Because you're taking advice, you're taking, you're, you're taking what this person is telling you. So that the hadith continues, it says, if the نَاطِق, if the speaker is speaking on behalf of God, then it's as if you have worshipped God. If the speaker is speaking on behalf of shaitan, meaning anything that brings you away from Allah, then it's as if you have worshipped shaitan. Also, Allah says in the Quran, Have you seen the one who takes their Lord as their desires? They take their desires as their Lord. When they're hungry, they don't care. When they're thirsty, they don't care. When they have a sexual desire, they don't care about any laws, anything else. When they, when they want power, they're willing to kill, they're willing to oppress. This is how some people are. This is the nature of human beings. We have to go back to Allah. So when I say, La ilaha illallah, it means I have to reject all of the literal and figurative gods that we are worshipping. We have to make sure that we cleanse our heart from anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he stood on the mountain of Safa. When, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered for him to go and deliver the message of Islam, he went on the mountain of Safa, which was overlooking the Kaaba, and he began to call out, Ayyuha nas, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. O people, say la ilaha illallah, and you will be victorious. Meaning, remove all other deities, remove all other chains, all other anything that's holding you down, that's bringing you away from Allah, you will be victorious. Now, there were many of the mushrikeen, it was very difficult for them to say, La ilaha illallah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, in the battle of the Khandaq, he tells Amr ibn Awad, all you have to do is say, La ilaha illallah. Say, La ilaha illallah, we don't need to fight. Amr ibn Awad, he tells him, this kalima, this La ilaha illallah, is heavier than the mountains. Now for the Muslim, for the believer, it's very easy to say la ilaha illallah. It's such an easy word to say. However, the mushrikeen, it was very difficult for them to say la ilaha illallah. Because that means they have to reject all of their idols. They have to reject their past. They have to reject the, way of, the ways of their forefathers. And that was something that was difficult for them. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Allah says in the Quran, they, the mushrikeen, when you tell them, when, when they were told to say, La ilaha illallah, they become very arrogant. And they say, 
Should we leave our idols to a mad poet, referring to Rasulullah as a sha'ar, a poet, and someone who's majnoon, who's mad? Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends the Prophet. Allah says, he's not a majnoon. He is bringing the Qur'an upon you. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, la ilaha illallah is very heavy. It's very important. Imam al-Rida alayhi salam on his way to Khurasan when Ma'moon, the Abbasi Caliph, he summoned Imam al-Rida to go to Khurasan. Imam al-Rida, he passed by several towns. So he passed by, he passed by a town which is not too far from Mashhad, Khurasan, where the Imam is buried today, a town by the name of Neishabur. Neishabur. That city was a hausa. That city was a, Islam, a place of an Islamic seminary, non-Shia Islamic seminary. It was from the Sunni seminary, and it had thousands of scholars. So the imam, he stayed there for a while. Then, as he was leaving, he went on, on the camel, and he was leaving. He's going, to Khuras, he's going to Khurasan, to current day Mashhad, where he was. And on his way there, they say that 24,000 muhaddithin, 24,000 narrators of hadith, they came, they had their pens in, in their hand and a paper, and they tell the imam, oh son of Rasulullah, ya ibn Rasulullah, we want you to hear, we want you to say a hadith that you narrate from your ajdad, from your forefathers. So here, even though they were Sunni, they were not Shia, they were not followers of the Imam, but they want to hear a hadith from the Imam because they know he's from the descendants of Rasulullah. He's from the children of, from, from the progeny of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So they tell him, we want a hadith from you. So Rasulullah sallallahu, uh, excuse me, uh, Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, he was on the camel and the camel had a cover on it. A, they would make like a small room which would protect from the sun. He, he, and there's a curtain. He removed the curtain and these 24,000 people, they saw the face of the Imam. This hadith is narrated by Alam al-Majlisi in Bihar al-Anwar and in Uyun Akhbar al-Rida. Uyun Akhbar al-Rida by uh, Shaykh al-Saduq and the hadith that the Imam mentioned is narrated by thousands because thousands were there. 24,000 they attended and Sunnis, they also attended this. They say that when the Imam removed it, the people there, they had traveled long distances just to come and see someone who's a grandson of the Prophet. Because at that time, the Muslim empire had gone through so many wars and, and you know, so much strife and difficulty. They had, the Muslims were very distant from the true essence of Islam. So now they see the grandson of the Prophet. The Hadith says that when they saw the face of Imam al-Rida, some of them, they fainted. Some of them, they, they fainted and they were awestruck by the face of this great Imam. Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam. So he waited until they calmed down. And then he tells them, سَمِعْتُ مِنْ أَبِي مُوسَى بْنِ جَعْفَرْ الْكَاظِمْ alayhi salam. I heard from my father, Musa ibn Ja'far, who heard from his father, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, who heard from his father, Imam al-Baqir, who heard from his father, Imam Zain al Abidin, who heard from his father, Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, who heard from his father, Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, who heard from his brother, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who heard from Jibra'il, who heard from Allah. So now this is called Hadith as Silsila Dahabiya, the golden chain. It has a golden chain because where can you find a chain as pure as that? So what did he hear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says, Kalimatu la ilaha illallah husni. The statement of la ilaha illallah, there's no deity except Allah, is husni, is my fortress. Faman dakhala husni amina min adabi. And whoever enters into my fortress, this person is safe from my punishment. This person is safe from my wrath. So when you say, La ilaha illallah, you're entering into the fortress 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore you are safe from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, you have to say it with belief. Otherwise, Fir'aun, Pharaoh, when he saw the death right in front of him, he also said, I, I believe in the God of Musa and Harun. But Allah tells him, Al -ana wa qad Now, after what you have done, Saddam also, when he saw that it's time, death right in front of his eyes, he started saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha That has no value. When a person, after they see death, then they come and they, they want to say it. It's, it, you have to, it has to be something that is based on belief. Your actions and your blood and your, your, your bones and your flesh all have to testify la ilaha illallah. So the Imam alayhi salam, he says, Kalimatu la ilaha illallah husni, faman dakhala husni, amina min adabi. And then the Imam, he adds one thing to it. He tells them, bisharqiha wa shurutiha. La ilaha illallah has a shart. La ilaha illallah has conditions. Otherwise, anyone could say la ilaha illallah. It has conditions. You have to truly believe. You have to truly submit. You have to truly reject all other idols, all other literal and figurative gods and deities out of your life. Bisharqiha wa shurutiha. And then the Imam says, wa ana min and I am one of the conditions of la ilaha. What does this mean? This means that you have to believe in the imamah of all of the imams, including Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam, so that your la ilaha illallah will be a sound la ilaha. Because you will not believe in Allah if you don't believe in Rasulullah. And if you don't fully believe, if you don't believe in the Imam after Rasulullah, then you have not believed in Rasulullah. And you have to believe in every single Imam. So it all goes back to Tawheed. The Imam that you follow will lead you to the correct Tawheed. And this is what we see today. The individuals, the groups that have not followed the Ahlul Bayt, the groups that have marginalized and sidelined the Ahlul Bayt, even their Tawheed is wrong. Even their Tawheed. You find in Bukhari, he says that on a Thursday night, Allah in a body of a blonde young man who has locks and is wearing a golden sandal. He comes down on a donkey every Thursday night. This is narrated by Bukhari. Is this Tawheed? Is this La ilaha illallah? Believing that God has a body, God has an image, and he has golden locks? No, this is Greek, myth Greek mythology. This is not the Islam of the Ahlul Bayt, the Islam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but the, the error, the problem occurred when people were derailed because others who were not qualified, they came and they took positions of leadership. So Imam al-Rada, he says, بِشَرْطِهَا وَشُرُوطِهَا وَأَنَا مِنْ شُرُوطِهَا Now we will continue with Al-Hayyu Al-Qayyum. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa Al-Hayyu Al-Qayyum. The ever-living. Al-Hay is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else is Hay, the living, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the hayat, the life, is the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single one of us, I'm alive right now, but there was a time that I was not alive, and there's a time that I'm not going to be alive. But Allah is always hay. Allah is the hay, al hay, meaning that He's always alive. God, life is not given to God, and it's not taken away from God. God was not created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the creator of the life that we're living. Allah does not have a beginning and does not have an end. He's always eternally hay. He's eternally alive. And this is why hay is the essence of God. Some people ask who created God? This is a wrong question because you're assuming that there was someone that came before God. You're assuming that God did not live. Allah is always the living. Now, some of us, we compare our hayat with the hayat of God. When I'm alive, I eat, I drink, I sleep, and I die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does that apply to him? Does God need to grow and eat and sleep and drink and die? That does not apply to Allah. When we say Allah is the hay, this means that Allah has the knowledge. Allah has the power. Allah is the all-seeing. Allah is the all-hearing. Allah has absolute authority over everything. Our life, this hayat that we're living, this is not the true life. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهْوٌ وَلَعِبٌ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ 
this hayat dunya this is games and this is illa lahwan wa la'ab distraction and games the true hayat the true life is the akhirah the eternal afterlife that is the hayawan hayawan means it is the life the eternal life al hay al qayyum qayyum when i'm standing i say ana qa'im god is standing on his own qayyum meaning that nothing gave life to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god is standing on his own god does not require support lam yalid wa lam yulad god is not does not give have children and god is not born so god is the qayyum meaning that he is the ever living and he is the standing on his own and he gives life to others al hay he's the living and he's standing on his own and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives life to others all the other creation came to this creation because of allah allah is the one who gave life allah gave life to you and i and to the virus and to the bacteria and everything allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it life inshallah in the next session we will continue with the verse of ayatul kursi allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum la ta'khudhuhu sinatun wa la nawm inshallah we will continue